friend with that kind of stuff. Being, <laughs> the devil's world or something. Mm -hmm. Something like that. I've heard wow. of that. Somebody <laughs> said, somebody mentioned Can I have a Kleenex, please? Yes. Someone. There are, oh, yeah. I, I should know people? that already. Is that uh, yeah, no, they're not. Empty. That's good. I just got sneezy all of a sudden and yeah. you guys talking about the virus. <laughs> <laughs> Caused oh, me to be man. psychosomatic. Oh, <laughs> oh, you didn't know that? No. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Down here, it was oh, rain. We just got so. rain. You live yeah. up in the yeah, it was all high was Rockies. I'm at the, the office, so I sneeze and I was. Yeah, I just got COVID. Okay, <laughs> so uh, who are we praying for? So John's uncle and aunt are coming tomorrow. Okay. And they're going to be here for the weekend. They. Right. Um, um just pray that we have a good visit okay yeah and believers they are believers good. um perfect we've been just struggling through this whole thing yeah it's been very hard all right <laughs> yeah it's been very hard it's just been not okay all right yeah so hmm. this is the first time we've been able to have any contact with them in a couple of years. Oh, wow. Okay. Exciting. Yeah, it is. Richard's named after him. Um, so. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, anything else? Same old, same old. Okay. What, waiting through boxes. Waiting. All right. <laughs> um, Bill Purrier. Uh, he, uh, they still don't know what's wrong with his weakness in his legs or working on it. Uh, he has some tremors in his hands. Could be early Parkinson's. It could be, you know, all kinds of things. So he's faith resting. So wisdom for the doctors? Is yeah, the yeah, good diagnosis, solid diagnosis. Mm -hmm. He's got more tests coming up, uh, MRIs and that sort of thing. So. Uh, pray for him, and um, let's see what else is on our list, Renee. Got okay. I think our visa application will be mailed off a week from tomorrow. So pray for pray for all the preparations. So it out in French. Or yeah. Yeah, it says that. This must be filled out in French. So shouldn't be too much of a problem. <laughs> yeah, but a problem. Okay, so uh, we'll just pray for God's grace for everyone. That's out. Lord, we uh, submit ourselves to your word this hour uh, to listen to what uh, you've written down <clears throat> so long ago uh, for our benefit. Uh, let us receive the teaching as you gave it. Um, we pray for uh, Karen and her endurance and perseverance as she finishes moving in. Uh, we pray for the Hockleys and her visit uh, with John's uh, uncle. Um, and uh, Lord, we uh, just pray for a great Christian witness there, good, sound uh, conversation. In Jesus' name, amen. John 13, 1 to 20. Um, <clears throat> We began to introduce this passage last week, and what we did, we kind of returned to the Gospel of John and started to get the run up to this. Um, this is a famous foot washing incident. Uh, there's a run up from the Gospel of John 
And that's one run up to it. That's one introduction. And then there's an introduction from the other three gospels because this occurs right at a specific moment uh, in uh, the upper room uh, narrative. And that is right after the disciples decide they want to get in a big fight over who's the greatest. So um, <clears throat> we have another golden family moment from the disciples, uh, moronic family moment, <laughs> something. Uh, they just, they failed and uh, fell to temptation again. And we get that from Matthew, Mark, Mark, and Luke. But now we've gone back to uh, the prior chapters in John because it starts out this way in John 13. Now, before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he should transition from this world to the Father, after loving his own who were in the world, loved them to the end. So it's a distinct introduction, a distinct scene setting from the other four Gospels. Jesus knew that this was the week and that this was the eve of his transition to the Father. He really, one of the things we did last week, we, we demonstrated that he really had a keen sense of understanding. He knew when it wasn't his time yet, John 7, 1 through 9. And then we began to dig into John 12, 23 to 26, where Jesus makes this big announcement. The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Now, it's a little bit interesting to me that He's announced before to the disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, be persecuted by and killed by the Jewish leadership, and then rise again on the third day. He said that much. But I, I like this expression, glorified. I like this because... You know, we can uh, look at it from a couple of perspectives. Uh, we sit, see Jesus in his utter humility of being crucified. We see it from a human viewpoint. He's being crucified. He is separated from the Father. Uh, it's the most humble moment uh, in any human being in all of history. Jesus dying for the sins of mankind. And then... We can look at it from another standpoint. Uh, on other occasions, the Heavenly Father has said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And we have this 1 John chapter 2, where it says he's the propitiation for our sins, which means that as the sacrifice for our sins, the Father was well pleased in him. And I, I think of it this way, that there really, can there be any greater glory than this moment of the Son of God sacrificing himself willingly for the sins of mankind uh, so that we might uh, know God and live forever and have our sins forgiven uh, so that this all may happen? You know, it's a great moment. It's a wonderful moment in human history, and it's the greatest moment of all. So it's his hour of glory, and he associates the glory even with what he must endure. Um, and he, he's cognizant of that, as we saw last week, most assuredly. I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. And so service is a key to honor for human beings. But then in verse 27, we understand that his entire purpose is focused on the coming hours. 
Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose, I came to this hour. So he's using hour in kind of a loose sense. Uh, I came to this time or this moment in my life. And so, Father, glorify your name. And then you get the voice out of heaven, right? I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. And all the bystanders thought they heard an angel, it was a thunderous voice. And then Jesus taught the bystanders in verses 30 to 36. And so <clears throat> this, uh, this voice came for your sake. Now it's the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. What is it? Let me just see about that. Mm -hmm. oh, there's two people here. John Hockley wants in? Okay. <laughs> You're in. All right. Always happy to let these people in. Interesting bunch, though. <laughs> They're front rangers, ornery. Mm -hmm. Best people in the world. Mm -hmm. So Jesus is um, teaching about the uh, eminent judgment of the world and the ruler of this world is going to be cast out. This is going to have an effect on the fallen angels. It's going to be that ultimate judgment. So uh, this uh, part continues uh, the significance of his death uh, and signifying by what death he would, uh, he would come when it's talking about him being lifted up. Uh, they misunderstand the Christ. We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say the son of man must be lifted up? Who is this son of man? So they have messed up theology. Go figure. Um, they don't even... Um, when you look at your concordance, it usually cross-references 2 Samuel 7.13. So I ask you, is 2 Samuel 7.13 in the law? No, it's not in the first five books of the Bible. So cross-reference can be a little bit messed up here, or they're messed up in saying it. Uh, we've heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. It's always possible that they're erroneous and associating, uh, you know, they don't have to be truthful here for John to record it perfectly. And uh, in any event, um, I really, kind of, my first inclination was, well, where in the law does it say Messiah has to remain forever? You, you know, I, uh, I really struggled with that one. So, um, it's possible the people say it wrong. It's not possible the scriptures say it wrong. The scriptures can accurately record error and do so on many occasions. So he calls them to stay in the truth. He calls them to continue believing uh, while you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. So uh, again, this is a lead up out of John chapter 12 into John 13. And I just want to remind you of one more thing. And we'll hit it again tonight. It was from the Father's side that he came. John 3, 13 to 15 records this. No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. We have this uh, cool doctrine that Jesus is the eternal son. He was always the son of God. He is co-eternal with the father and he is eternally the son. The doctrine of the eternal sonship. Now, uh, many hundreds of years ago, they really struggled with this. Uh, theologians, this was one of the first things they really uh, tack, had to tackle. Uh, there's another one called the procession of the son. Uh, Jesus proceeded from the father. And some of it is here, you know, Jesus proceeded from the father. He had a beginning. Well, 
Oh, that's heresy. Jesus is eternal God. He's always existed. And his relationship with the Father, we call them Father and the Son. Now, uh, we have children, and I, uh, our children had a beginning, okay? And yet, Jesus is the Son, but he has no beginning and no end. And so, it's not talking about the Father fathering Jesus and therefore giving him a beginning. It's talking about the relationship between the two uh -huh. is father-like and son-like and always has been. So uh, if you were thinking of going that way with some heresy leading us all down that heretical uh -huh. path, I'm going to just save you the trouble uh -huh. right now. Okay. John 4, 34, Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work so um god sent jesus right same idea in um, john 3 13 through 15 john 4 34 john 5 30 i can do nothing uh i can from myself do nothing as i hear i judge and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. The Father sent the Son. Does this mean the Son has a beginning? No, nope, no beginning. Eternal existence and eternity past. John 6, 38. I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So the Father sent. Now with that, this means that it's the Father's plan. He is in authority over the Son, and we have that eternal Father-Son relationship. And it's the Father's plan, and he sends Jesus. And this is, this is how it works. So it's from the Father's side that he came. With respect to the timing, let's go on to John 13, 2. I am determined to wash feet before we go to Tahiti. <laughs> but it, it, we're not going to wash feet tonight. Okay, we're still, we're still doing that. We're still getting ready. After supper came, the devil already having cast into the heart of Judas of Simon, of Iscariot, that he might betray him. So, um, oh, I don't know how to say it. I'm going to do my mad scientist fingers here. Um, what a delicious verse this is for so many reasons. So fun to teach. Uh, you have linguistic things, uh, which um, I'm an expert on. Uh, you have the devil casting into the heart of Judas, of Simon, of Iscariot, meaning Simon's his father. They're from the Iscariot, of the Iscariot Simons, I guess you would say. And that sounds different from the devil entering in. To Judas, doesn't it? The devil throws something into Judas' heart. Is that the same thing as entering into Judas' body and taking control? See, there's there's some difference here. Um, let's uh, go back to our uh, the Bible according to Flip Wilson. <laughs> The devil made me do it. Or was that laugh in? I forget which one it was. It was the 60s. Could have been either one. So uh, the devil made me do it, right? Oh, did he? Uh, the devil tempted me to do it. Who, who's ever been tempted? Well, yeah. Who's ever been under satanic deceit? Well, all of us here. Well, nodding our heads, yeah, me, me too. 
two, okay? All, each one of us, every single one of us have been deceived. Uh, is it fair to say that every one of us here and listening along uh, have had the experience of uh, at least a demon casting some idea into your heart? I mean, these are bad ideas, right? It's not like this is a good idea. But haven't, uh, doesn't every human being sooner or later have the experience of having an idea thrown into your heart? It says cast into the heart, having cast into the heart of Judas. So um, Judas was demon possessed to do this. Maybe not yet, but why don't we sort it out together, okay? Um, so by the time that supper came, Judas had already responded to the satanic suggestion to betray Jesus. Hadn't he already made the big plan with the Pharisees, gotten to 30 pieces of silver? Hadn't he already done all this? He's already been under that satanic influence. But having an idea cast in your heart is not the same as demon possession. What do you do when you have an unclear passage in, in art and science of hermeneutics? You kind of go out and look around for clearer passages. So that's, that's the way I did this. All right. Um, Jesus already knew that Judas was a slanderer. And so let's go to John chapter six for one. Uh, Jesus has known this for a long time. Now, it's interesting, uh, the use of this word. You know? uh, and it's in, in the New King James, this is a mistaken translation. So I'm going to clue you in on this. Then Jesus said to the 12, do you also want to go away? Because they had a desertion. And uh, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we've come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered them. Isn't this interesting? He speaks to the 12. Simon alone answers him. And then he addresses the 12 again. Did I not choose you, the 12? And one of you is a, what is your, what does your translation say? One of you is a, John 6, 68, 69. An adversary. An adversary. Interesting uh, translation. Okay. Uh, how about devil? Anyone have devil? John 6, 70, pardon me. One of you is a. Yes, I have devil. James. Devil. Okay. Interesting, right? Fascinating. Was Jude, uh, okay, we call Satan the Diabolos, which means deceiver, slanderers, better translation. Adversary, hmm, that's more like Satan than it is Diabolos, uh, in the, you know, the Greek uh, lexicons. Um, but Diabolos, anyone can be a Diabolos. Diabolos is in the, uh, uh, it, it's in the sin list uh, along the way. Don't, don't participate in slander. And so um, just interesting that he calls him not the devil, but a devil. And I don't think, I wouldn't go with a devil. I think a slanderer, uh, you, you know, someone who is a, uh, destroyer of rep reputations. And so Jesus just characterizes Judas in that way. He calls him all the time uh, the, um, the betrayer. Uh, when we get to, uh, you know, toward the end of this in Matt, uh, uh, John 13, 27, um, 
and other places, go do what you're going to do. So why don't we, that John 6, 67 and 71 isn't particularly helpful, uh, but we do get Jesus calling him a slanderer. I don't think, it, you know, he's a slanderer in a sense, and he's satanic in that way, but he's not Satan. He's not possessed by Satan. Luke 22, 3 to 6, then Satan entered Judas. So now we have a fallen angel bodily entering the person of Judas. Uh, it's the chief of the fallen angels, Satan himself, the worst of them all. And when did this happen? So he went his way and conferred with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him to them, and they were glad and agreed to give him money. This is before the Last Supper. You see, before this happens, Judas is already sin possessed. So um, let's test your demon knowledge, shall we? Can a person be possessed, unpossessed, repossessed? Yeah. Well, I think it's very clear from scripture. Jesus had that description. Uh, oh, you, get, you, you know, you got the demon cast out, got everything cleaned out, and whoop, comes back in, right? And so, you know, don't be that guy. So Satan entered Judas. In Luke 22, 3. And then perhaps he left Judas. But let's just go down the page a little bit in John 13 to John 13, 27. After the piece of bread, Satan entered him. And Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. Okay. I, I have a question and I'm not sure I got the answer for this. Who is Jesus addressing, Satan or Judas, at that moment? Who's he addressing? Yes. One of those people. <laughs> or both. But if Satan has entered into him, who is, uh, as they say, at the wheel of Judas' body? It would be Satan. So I think I would lean toward Jesus. Uh, saying this to Satan, who is possessing Judas' body, okay? So when, uh, and, it, and so just, just to follow up this whole thing, when Satan or a demon are in a person, you must cast them out, right? That was, you know, an option, at least during Jesus' time. Matthew 9, 32 and 33, as they went out, behold, they brought to him a man, mute and demon possessed. So the very expression demon possessed means the demon is in the possession of the person's faculties. Uh, he's in uh, possession. This is why you have things like the strange case of the, uh, of the demon possessed man uh, in the graveyard with the chains and you know, all that stuff, well, he's in charge. And apparently being demon possessed can also give you some superhuman strength along the way. Uh, because he, uh, you know, uh, they just had all kinds of issues with him. And so <clears throat> um, you cast out the demon, right? He's demon possessed and it says it cast out the demon. So possession itself means that the demon is in charge of the faculties. Very interesting that Judas surrendered himself over to Satan because this is what you have to do. It has to be a willful um, submission to Satan. It has to be willful. You know, you have to say, okay, you have to be cognizant in some way. Now, look, there are all kinds of avenues I kind of don't want to get into this, but okay, we will. There are all kinds of avenues to demon possession. 
and I, I know I'm going to sound um, maybe a little Baptisty or something uh, because I'm going to mention <laughs> dancing, uh, you, you know, drugs, dancing, um, singing, uh, music. Um, you know, it kind of gives you the creeps to, uh, uh, you know, look at people at a rave, you know, a rave, I know that makes me a million years old, right? <laughs> do people rave anymore? Now, what do they do? Are we, are we back to waltzing? What are we? Where are we in the whole dancing cycle? You know, dancing has a, has a historical cycle, right? So we'll be back to waltzing in a few years. Yeah, it's like, six yes, yeah. uh, see, see? <laughs> And uh, you know, with the uh, like, uh, you, you know, the the long uh, long collars and the, and the wide lapels. We'll be back to that. Just hold on to your clothes. So, anyway, um, the demon possesses, and he's got control. And then the demon is cast out. So he's he's outside the body. He's not in control anymore. So that's what demon means. I think you have to surrender. I think you have to, you know, in some way, have a submission to the demon. And you never want to go into that twilight of an ecstatic mental state where you're kind of out of your mind, whether it's meditation, whether it's exercise, whether it's dancing, whatever it is, um, not a good idea. Now, if you're a, a believer in Jesus Christ, uh, those kinds of states aren't a good idea still not a good idea. You always want to remain in control of your faculties. But I will say this, that if God possesses you, Satan cannot. And God possesses you. You are the possession of God. You belong to him. You've been bought with the price, the blood of Christ, the precious blood of Christ purchased you because of that moment of redemption at the moment of your belief. There's no way. <clears throat> you belong to God. So Mark 1, 32 to 34, at evening when the sun had set, uh, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. So possession, demons in you, he's in control, cast out by the authority of Jesus, or even the delegated authority of Jesus the demons can be cast out. You can talk directly to the demon and say, get out of him. And, and they have the authority to do that. Demons, after all, are just creatures. And they must submit. Uh, you know, you don't need silver bullets or crosses or holy water or any of that, um, you, you know. Uh, the Exorcist is not a training video. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, uh, just, uh, and again, that means, that, you know, by referring to the Exodus, it means I'm um, from a previous geological age, <laughs> not this one. But um, uh, I mean, at least it was still a talky, so uh, not quite that old, but getting there. <sighs> now. Here's what I noticed that is really interesting about this moment. Jesus addresses who? Satan? I think so. Go do what you must do. Yes? Does Jesus have the authority to cast Satan out of Judas? Yes. This is an interesting, interesting moment. He has the authority to do it. Everybody in that room thinks he's talking to Judas. Like Judas has to go out and we're out of milk. You know, go do what you have to do. Get us some milk, Judas. I think everybody in that room misses the moment. But on further reflection, John recorded it for us. Okay. So this is, this is so interesting to me i don't i don't know if it's cool it's horrifying but jesus refrains from casting out satan 
from Judas when he could have fully empowered to do so. So what a moment, uh, because it had to be. Let's go back to this moment now. After supper came, the devil already having cast into the heart of Judas of Simon of Iscariot that he might betray him. Kai deipnu genamenu to diabolo e de beblekatas esten cardion. Yuda Simonas Iscar Iscariutu Hina Auton Parado. So a little Greek for you there. Guess what? There, there are two genitive absolutes. They're coordinating genitive absolutes. Like, okay, back up a minute. What? They're participles. They're uh, an, um, anomalous according to their grammatical construction, meaning they're weird, they're bizarre. They're not in, a, they're not, it's impossible for them to be grammatically connected to the rest of the sentence. So they're isolating and they've isolated, they've done, isolated two clauses here. After supper came. And what John's doing here, he's showing that this is an extraordinary moment. So supper coming, um, this is just a nice, pleasant moment in the evening. In this case, it's a Passover supper. After supper came. And because it's in a genitive, it's a genitive participle of reference to be specific. After supper came, tells you that whatever follows is going to be really extraordinary. After supper came, sounds like, you know, it was a quiet day on Main Street, but you know it's going to be extraordinary. After supper came, for 1400 years they've been having Passover suppers and they're cool, but after supper came, makes it sound like this is calm and this isn't. What's next is not gonna be the norm for a Passover meal. You know what's coming next, it's gonna be mind boggling. And then the second one, it's the same thing, an isolated uh, genitive participle of reference here, having cast it in the heart of Judas that he might betray him. So the second thing, there's two things now. And then Jesus gets ready for the, uh, well, almost. It's ready to wash feet. So without knowing what follows, without having ever read John 13 before, you would know that whatever comes next is going to be out of this world. And they're called coordinated um, participles of reference. Um, ever since I wrote my book, they've been called that. Okay. <laughs> You're like, when do we get to read that? Well, I don't know. I'll have a little, have a little talk with my publisher soon. So since he's a friend. But um, uh, anyway, so um, whenever they coordinate like that, it's like it gets bigger. It's like the music gets louder, okay? And so you know that some big moment's coming. So that's what we have here. Um, there are coordinated participles of reference in Mark 6, 21 and 22, which developed a rising sense of horror at the uh, death and beheading of John the Baptist. Similar coordination in Mark 14, 17 and 18, uh, which conveyed the ominous moment of Jesus' announcement concerning the presence of a betrayer. But wait a minute. He's using uh, coordinated participles of reference about the betrayer. It, you know, Judah, uh, the devil has already cast into Judas' heart this idea of betrayal. And so it's not about this. It's interesting that he takes it... Um, it, you know, this 
wow, look out, there's going to be a betrayal, and uses it as the calm, normal, Main Street moment to set us up for the foot washing. Well, kind of. Why don't we go to John 13, verse 3. After Jesus having known that the Father had given all things into his hand, and that he came from God and to him is going. So Jesus realized again that he had been given all authority. And actually, why don't we go back to John chapter 3, verse 35 for just a moment. Is this Jesus' first realization that he's been given all authority? I mean, we, we have the big one, right? Matthew 28, 18, all authority has been given to me on heaven and, uh, in heaven and on earth. It's kind of the big one, the Great Commission. Yeah, the big one. But um, when did Jesus first realize this? The father loves the son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now, I know what you're maybe thinking. I'm an expert on the uh, Gospel of John chapter 3. And we don't exactly know when Jesus stopped speaking and John started writing about Jesus. Is this whole thing a quote from Jesus? Or does John take over at some point? And if he's taken over at some point, uh, the father loves the son, has given all things in, into his hand. Could be John reflecting 40 years after the fact, 50 years after the fact. And just saying this for the sake of his audience. Or is it a quote of Jesus? So I put it there because it could be Jesus. Uh, it's just hard to tell if there is a transition from the Jesus quote to John teaching doctrine. It's a little hard. I, I acknowledge the challenge because there's a challenge there. Why don't we go to John 5, 22 to 27? John 5. 22-27. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. That all should honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So all judgment has been committed to the Son. What does it mean, all judgment? What do you think of all means? All means some judgment? Does all mean all? It's the Bill Clinton test, right? Well, it depends on what the meaning of is, is. You know, so... Uh, I love John 5, 24, because it gives a single requirement for bypassing the judgment of the Son. Don't want to be judged by the Son? Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Has passed. It's a one-way passage. Has passed from death into life. And then uh, 25, most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Uh, those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And then has given him, as the Father 
has given the son authority to execute judgment also because he's the son of man. There's so many cool things about verse 26. The father has life in himself. He's granted the son to have life in himself. Uh, it's given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. What's the reason? Why is it that all authority to judge has been given to Jesus? What's the reason? He is the son of man. Now, is this some intrinsic quality? What does this mean, son of man? What's well, kind of a cool uh, scriptural expression? Um, Ezekiel is called a son of man. Jesus is called the son of man. It means he is a human being. It's emphasizing the humanity of Christ. Why is Christ the judge of all humanity? Because he is truly human. It's so wonderful. The symmetry of this this wonderful symmetry let's turn over to luke chapter 10 verses 18 to 20 so at, at the very least jesus has been given authority to execute judgment because he has become man what do you think about this when did uh, jesus become man well, when he was born. All right. I mean, uh, I'm sure there's an argument about uh, was it a conception or when he was born and so on. Um, the scripture records both conceived of the Holy Spirit, um, born of a woman but not from a seed of man. It certainly wasn't conceived from Joseph. Um, he certainly, his human body was certainly formed in the womb. Okay. And, and along with his human body, his, his brain, and uh, I would say his personality certainly formed in the womb as well. Um, I think we could follow David and, Say that Jesus in most parts were formed and crafted, knit together, I think is what David said in Psalm 139, uh, that all of, uh, all of this uh, was a marvel. And um, Jesus was fully human, fully, completely human. And that's why that now has Jesus been exalted yet? No. Can you say he's been glorified yet? No, I think we encountered that in, uh, in John 12. You know, now the son will be glorified, Jesus said in John 12. So it's indicating it's coming up, it's coming right up. You know, this glorifying moment. So has he been glorified? Has been exalted? Does he, uh, you know, resurrection, ascension, session, sit at the right hand of the Father and exalted there, according to Philippians chapter 2? Hasn't happened yet. But has he been given authority, according to John 5? Man, you got to be with me on that, okay? Because that's what it says. Let's go to Luke 10, 18 to 20. Um, Follow the bouncing ball. Okay, he said to them, I saw, uh, this is when the 70 returned. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. There, uh, or nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names 
or written in heaven. So he says, I give you the authority. Who gave him the authority to do that? You can only give authority if you have it. So he's been given authority over fallen angels, to cast out fallen angels. It's already been given uh, to him. So authority to judge, it's already there, right? Just by becoming human. He's been given authority over the angels. Uh, you know, we can talk about when that happened, but it's there. But let's keep reading in Luke chapter 10. I want to pick up in um, verse 21, just right subsequent to it. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. All things have been delivered to me by my Father. What does it mean, all things? Everything has been delivered to me. Now, this is past. This is past. Related to Luke chapter 10. This isn't at the cross. This isn't the resurrection. This isn't the ascension. This isn't the session. This isn't the exaltation. This isn't the glorification. Glorification, cross, resurrection, ascension, exaltation, seated at the right hand of the Father. For this reason, he has highly exalted him. We'll, we'll see. I'll show you. But he mentions, uh, you know, all things have been delivered to me by my Father. So let's go to Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Jesus came and spoke to them. This is post-resurrection. All authority has been given to <clears throat> me in heaven and on earth. When? Just now? You know, oh, guys, guys, 10 minutes ago, all authority was given to me in heaven and on earth. Really? How do you know when it was given? You get any, any theory? Good theory? Well, I mean, he already had authority to judge in John chapter 5, indisputably. He had authority to judge in John chapter 5. He already had authority to cast out demons from people and all the other stuff. Authority over nature, by the way, in Luke chapter 10, uh, because you can step on scorpions, blah, 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 you know, don't try this at home, but, or in nature. Um, <clears throat> but uh, did he already had, if he could give it in Luke chapter 10, didn't he already have it? So when did this happen? You see, there's this little moment, this cool little moment, and it's way back in the Old Testament. It's actually in the book of Daniel. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. Now, uh, it's an interesting struggle to place this in the midst of all these prophecies uh, uh, about uh, the future. And what, what is the placement of this? Is this at the second advent, so I would say the second advent because he's just been talking about the uh, uh, Roman Empire and all that immediately preceding this, but it's prophecy. Okay, so is, are we looking forward to the second advent? Because Daniel says, I was watching the night visions and behold, one like the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. So he's now is he going to earth or to heaven? Which direction? What's this? Where are we? Let's get our, our, our uh, marauders map out. Harry Potter reference. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's get the let's get the map out. Where are we right now? What, where's this scene unfolding? Heaven. heaven. Okay, so which direction 
are, you know, they, they're not going to earth. So Jesus coming with the clouds appears before the heavenly father. It's, it's not, it's not the second advent. Don't mistake this uh, with the great cavalry charge of revelation. Don't do that. Okay. So then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. Okay. Is this after his death, before his resurrection? Is it after his resurrection, before his ascension? Is it at his ascension? Sometime, maybe future to Daniel. The purpose of the dominion and glory and kingdom was that all people's nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. So could be after the ascension. Think, uh, that's a fair candidate. Could be after the ascension. It could be before the incarnation. Why does it make sense that it's before the incarnation? Well, here's, a, here's kind of the way I reason. Is Jesus making a kingdom offer to the Jews? That's a legitimate, bona fide kingdom offer. Is he doing that during his lifetime, before he dies or is resurrected or ascends or anything else? How could he offer the kingdom if it's not his to give? Okay, this is a, this is the way I reason about this. He could only offer the kingdom if it was legitimately his to give, if that dominion had already been given to him. If you're going to have a legitimate kingdom offer, I think Daniel 7, 13, and 14 belongs at the moment of incarnation. Okay, just my opinion about this. Uh, I'll have colleagues who disagree and um, I'm sure that uh, next time we all get together uh, there's going to be uh, torches, pitchforks, tar yeah, insurrection. Uh, I don't care, insurrection's fine as long as you got resurrection. So uh, yeah, you know, tars and, and feathering, uh, I'll do it, but Jesus can't offer the kingdom unless it's his to give, okay? So that's, a, that's how I reason with that. So let's go one, two, three, four to conclude tonight. One, he freely offered himself as a sacrifice for sin. Psalm 40, verses six through eight. Where is this? It's heaven. Psalm 40, six through eight. Hebrews uh, chapter... 10 validates the timing of this as right before he came into the world. Uh, so freely offered himself sacrifice for sin. Number two, he was given all authority to do what he came to do. So I can test that Daniel 7, 13 and 14 uh, are this is the same moment as Psalm 46 through 8. First, he offers himself, then he is given dominion, it says, he's given authority and glory and a kingdom. He's given that kingdom, right? It's his to give. No question, it's his to give. He offers it. Does that mean we're in the kingdom just because the kingdom? All the authority for the kingdom has been given to him. Does that mean that the, uh, the kingdom is now? Shall we go do the zoo test? <laughs> Leave your pet outside at night. And if the coyotes don't get it, it might be in the kingdom. I doubt it. Okay, let's talk about uh, Philippians 2, 5 through 11. And point number three, he was highly exalted 
after his incarnation, death, resurrection, and ascension. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. We'll deal with this more next week, but he was highly exalted. So uh, this is point number three. Um, is exaltation the same as coronation? Is exaltation the same as coronation? It's your homework assignment. It's not, I mean, the two words are not the same. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to finish off by reading Hebrews 2, verses 8 and 9. You put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. He's still not crowned except with glory and honor. He's exalted. But not all things are subjected to him yet. It is not the kingdom. So Hebrews chapter 2 teaches. And so I think it's fair to say exaltation is not coronation. And don't mix up the two. So when did he receive dominion and authority? I think the, the weight of the evidence is right before the incarnation. He's given authority to judge because he's becoming man. Uh, you know, he's the son of man. Uh, he is given authority to cast out demons. He has that authority when he becomes man um, because he's God. And then uh, I think you go a little further um, and you say, he has the authority to give the kingdom to his people, the Jews. Well, he has the authority to do that. They reject him. He's ready to do it. He's got the authority to do it. They reject him. So they crucify him. He's glorified by his death. He receives glory and ultimately exalted to the right hand of the Heavenly Father to the place of honor. But he's still not crowned. Coronation is yet future. So that's how I assemble all this best I can. Okay, a tiny bit over time. Oh, well, let's close in prayer. Lord, thanks for this time in your word. We can't wait until Jesus is crowned. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen.